is, is, or she is, is very plump at the moment because on Monday I decided to feed her a wrap and it's been very cold. Um, but yeah, today we're going to talk about um, monitor, monitor taming or socialization. If you put on Facebook with your taming thumb, they'll um, feed the so basically, we what we do, we run a mobile zoo where we take animals out, like these ones, we put them on large gamanas on little kids, do handles and stuff. We try to kind of disperse uh, bad bad images of gamanas, and even in the reptile hobby and industry, there's a lot of kind of like even with keepers that keep them as we've kept them in the past, there's still a lot of like the bad bad theories and bad myths and perceptions about them. And the biggest probably myth that I just like hearing is that goannas are unpredictable. Um, because people get bit and they won't remember exactly why they've got bit and then of course the animal is unpredictable. So it's the same as snakes, same as um, dragons, same as any animal really. Um, basically goannas are, if you watch a goanna and you watch the behaviour you can tell exactly what it's going to do. Uh, they're just pretty much just like people, uh, like any animal really, they're going to be as predictable as what you know the behaviour to be. Uh, Goannas don't want to tear you apart, they don't see you necessarily as a food source, but if they mistake you for a food source, or if, or if it's like a lace monitor for instance, they're going to defend themselves. Of course some, some Goannas are going to bluff you and not try to defend yourself and we're going to work through some of those a bit later on. What I'm going to do, I'm going to leave this guy up here because he's going to get, she's going to get my body warm while we're doing the talk, and she wants to hang about while I get smarter. <laughs> I'm a little bit trying to go under your head. She always wants to. She wants to climb up high. So when you're when you're keeping goannas in New South Wales, um, this one is a class one. So licensed classes, you've got to have a class one. We're going to do some holes with this guy later on, so we'll just put him on your shoulder and everything. This guy's our, this guy's our male, and he was one of our breeders for a while, um, until him and his girlfriend had a falling out. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, as you can see, he's missing a little bit of his tail, um, and she's, she's not uh, laying fertile eggs anymore, so we've split them apart, and they do, they're quite comfortable in their retirement apart. So this guy is nine years old. Um, now, with a lot of the techniques we're going to go through tonight, and if you look at our YouTube videos, you can see how we actually put them into play as well. Um, a lot of it's patience, uh, sitting there with the animals, something like a lace monitor, you've got to build trust and you've got to go in there. Something like a witch tail, which is like class one goanna, the very simplest way for you to get a witch tail to be tame and social is simply pull it out of the enclosure and hold it by the tail. Let the body sit on you. And you just hold the tail because in the wild, witch tails wedge their tails into rocks, so that makes them feel secure and safe. Whereas if you and while you leave the body free to roam about, they also feel that they're free and moving about, so they'll feel both safe and free at the same time. And that doing that over and over again gets them to a point where you can just pick them up without having any trouble. Of course, they've still got the the food response of the the larger goanna, and sometimes a bit, a bit more intense. These guys, they they quite. Um, Quite voracious eaters, but they um, they're very easy to get to just kind of come out and sit on you. He would sit on my shoulder as well, but I'm <laughs> fairly certain this guy would just kind of munch in and try to, and try to eat him. Well, that's about it. Just hold him down. Munch on. Uh, but he so, had a rat. Wouldn't he be like boil or something? Well, you think so? Like uh, this this so this this lace monitor. I actually thought. I could keep them in trios as well because we have some younger, um, younger females growing up. We put the female in, the other, the other younger female in, and the male, not a problem, even though the female is probably double the size of this, so it's still quite small. Our male, our male is like a metre fifty, just wandered about. And this one just, this girl just decided to chase it up a wall and try to eat it. We got it out, no trouble. It didn't, uh, didn't injure it or anything, um, which is another reason of the importance of um, having social goannas. If you're introducing them, uh, for instance, so you've got two goannas, you want to put a new one in. Um, if you are touching your goanna often and your goanna knows you and it's social with you, you can sit in there with it. 
if it gets touched by the other goanna, it's not going to freak out as much. If it doesn't have any interaction with another goanna or another human being or anything, and something touches it, it's going to think that's either food or that's something to attack. Me. So it's going to be a lot more tricky. And also, if, you, if you're in there with the actual um, goanna while well, it's going on, you can kind of interact and kind of Stop moving your, your hand so fast that you're losing <laughs> yeah. your He's quite used to it. He goes on little kids' birthday parties, so he doesn't really have any, too much of a too much of trouble being moved about. Oh no, they won't fall off. Their claws are sharp. That's it. So, so again, you've got to have a class. A class so you've got to have a class one of these guys for two years on the class one license before you can move up to a class two guy. You don't necessarily have to have a ridge tail. I mean, you've got blackhead uh, monitors, so like the Tristus um, or Antalus or the Tristus Tristus. So I think. Got the ridge tail and the sand oh. monitor, the cool and, just your and there's another one. There as well. the um, but once you do that, then you can move on to the class two reptiles, um, which they can be a bit more, a bit more interesting. Well, he's still very interesting. He's he, is, he is still very interesting. They're pretty awesome. Um, no, he's not now. interesting. He's cute. They're um, <laughs> he doesn't cute. take me monitor to. Yeah. Go in the class one with the ridge tails? I think they might be class two, but I haven't looked in a while. We're not allowed to have a class pet in our classroom. Sometimes when we're in public school, you're only allowed to talk for a class of class two. Well, that's quite a puppet. But, um, yeah, so there are, so there are different. Um, when you go to class two, you've got a wider range of, of goannas. Um, that you can work with, and like, say, the ridge tail comparison to the lakes monitor, there's so many different aspects for every different species. So you've got uh, Spencer monitor, which is a very common one. Now they're they're quite a common pet because they still grow quite large. Um, like I, I think like an average average male for like a really big one is probably about a meter twenty, I think, and then. But the thing about, say, a Spencer monitor, we don't have one with us today because um, we don't have them on our zoo license, we've just got them on our private. Uh, but they're pretty much like the ridge tail. So you pick them up, they're pups, they're pups, they, they will try to eat literally everything, including their cage mates, um, just anything that moves. Personally, I, I find them very, um, very frustrating. But, um, Are there any class threes? Not for. Rep, not for like the Atlantis, there are for like the Sentinels. How many classes are there for any reptile? I think there's five. What's the class five? Perenni. I have no idea on that one. Uh, Perenni is a uh, class two. So with the, with the Spencer, if you're trying to handle the Spencer, uh, basically you can just pick it up, it'll kiss and puff, but it's not going to scratch you as much as even a, even a Sandy, like a, a Gulby, is going to scratch you more than Spencer is. Spencer's basically just going to wrap its tail around you, hold on with its back legs, and puff. And like this. Saying that, that same animal that I would go to pick up, because we don't put too much work into our Spencers, we just, like, we, we care for them and stuff, and we'll pick them up, and we've got to do pick them up, but we don't do too much work socialising, because we have so many other ones that take a bit more effort. Um, but that same one that you pick up and it won't bite you, will run at my foot, mouth open, and try to bite my foot, thinking it's food as soon as I open the door. So it's, it's uh, when I say that they're, they're a lot easier, it's, it's once you get to that point where you pick them up. Before that, you've got to try and encourage them that you're not food, that you're just kind of picking them up. Um, then you've got the Sandies, like the Goolbies, and they're class, class one again, and they're, they're kind of similar, except in my experience, they, have, they do scratch a fair bit more, but you can, they are something that you can pick up. Um, again, with the Spencers and the Sandies, uh, you can do the other techniques that you do with these guys. It's just going to be a little bit harder. Um, because these guys are so intelligent and inquisitive, and the Parentes and the Laces are very intelligent and inquisitive, but the Laces are much more vulgar. So as a baby Hatchy Lacey about this big, he's going to open his mouth and chase you out of the enclosure. <laughs> And he's not afraid to use even though you like fancy. Parenti's going to kind of do the same, but they're also going to be a little bit less likely to actually punch on a bite, which is good, because in my experience, a parenti bite is so much more painful than a lazy bite. Is there a kind 
That's it, so this is a Komodo dragon skull. That was a good segue, but <laughs> um, you can have a feel. So this is a Komodo skull. It's not an actual one, it is a it is a clone of the skull, and as you can see it's got the teeth there, so in all the monitors when they open their mouth you don't like you do see little tiny teeth, but you don't see the whole picture of the teeth. Because these guys do have the venom inside their gums. Yeah. Do you pass it along guys? So, so it's in the gums. So when they bite down, it's like it's like a sponge and it's like squeezes. a stonefish sponge where they have to land like in a little socket underneath the spine oh. where um, when you step on it, it squishes. Yeah, so it's like the and that, that would be quite quite devastating. <laughs> so, they, be a so they've got the, They've got the venom in the gum, so when they bite down, it squeezes and oozes it into the holes that the teeth make. Now, there was a study done um, by, I think, Brian Fry, Brian Greg Fry, Brian Fry, um, on the, the toxicity of the venom. And lace monitors actually have a stronger toxicity than the actual Komodo dragons. It's just their delivery mechanisms aren't as large as like the Komodo dragon, so the bite size isn't as much. It's an anti-coagulant venom, so you will bleed and just kind of keep bleeding. So if you get bit by a lacy, what the lacy will actually do is they will munch down and squeeze. Once they're, once they're comfortable, like if they're still trying to get away from you, they'll kind of move and slice. The slicing is the dangerous bit, it's not any bite from the go on it. So if you pull away, that's when you're going to get stitches. Um, the, the worst scar I've got was from a wild lacy that was caught in a net at a at a show we were doing, it was caught in a net, and I was frustrated because it was trying to kind of death roll and tie myself up, so I didn't know what to do but put my hand in front of it and munched on, and I had to get uh, Kaylin over here to fry it off. But the trick is, it's there to just hold on. Um, if it's a wild one, it's so much different than if it's a tame one that's, or a social one that's in your um, captive care, because if it's in your captive care, You've got techniques that I'm going to speak about soon that you can kind of use to break the interactions. Um, one of those techniques, the best technique to use for captivity and to instill in your go at it, is a technique called the concentration break. Um, now I learned, I kind of learned the terminology for this one when I was doing work for Australia Zoo in the tiger section. And this guy I was working with, he had been bitten on the side of the leg by this tiger accidentally. They work with tigers all the time. And what happened was they've got these little hook sticks all the way around the enclosure. And I said, what is that so you can like hook in the tiger's mouth or something and pull the tiger back? They said, no, it's just to break the concentration in the tiger's head. So you, you hit the you hit the ground with the stick. You don't hit the tiger at all. Just the ground makes a big sound. Um, and then the tiger stops what it's thinking about, which is basically it's got you you in its mouth and it's got the blood and it's thinking that's food. So it allows the tiger to think and then realise this is actually a friend. Whoops, I'll let go and I'll open up. And it's the same with goannas. So whatever your concentration break is, for us, the best thing we do is the chin rub. So we go under the chin with all of them and we kind of give them a little, little chin rub. Now that worked really well when I got bitten by uh, one of our parentheses when we were training it up. It was my fault entirely I got bit because what happened was I was handling mice in front of the enclosure. It saw that. Then I went to feed it with chicken in a tray. And to tame these guys up to like socialize them, what I would do at the stage was I would open the door, I would put my hand there like this if they tried to jump out. So the only way that they would come out of the enclosure was by smelling my hand and then climbing up onto it. Obviously because they're inquisitive, they want to come out of the enclosure. They have to build up the the courage to kind of do it, but over time, if, you, if you're quiet and you sit there, they will come out and climb up. So this one was already at that stage where it would do that, but I was feeding it with a tray, so I had the tray of food there. It decided it didn't like the tray, it had already seen the mice, obviously, and then went to jump out of the enclosure. Now instinctively, with, and I got to wash my hands with the mice as well, instinctively, when I went to jump out of the enclosure, I put my hand there so that it could smell that and climb up. And it smelt my hand and it just munched on, dragged me into the enclosure. Now, for 
Guarantees, unlike Lacey's, they bite and they hold on and the pressure is very intense. Is that how um, like your um, king round in the um, outback? Well, in the outback, I think they'll thrash it. There's a few videos on YouTube you can see of them just going whack, yeah. thrashing them about just to break their backs. Why is everything nowadays on YouTube? <laughs> YouTube's, a, YouTube's a very good thing. We got a YouTube ourselves. <laughs> and, uh, another good plug. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, so it dragged me into the enclosure. Uh, luckily, there was a back on the enclosure, so it couldn't drag me further than I could stick my hand in there. And I dumped the tray of food next to it. I'm thinking, this is getting really, really painful. And it was the most painful thing I'd experienced. And I just, like, shoved my hand underneath. It was about to grab its, grab its neck around there. But in the process of doing that, I touched under the chin where I normally do. And as soon as I did that, it just released. Released and just went away, but nothing else was getting it to release, it just needed that kind of concentration break. Um, now it also works when you're feeding things as well, so we'll do a lot of videos on YouTube which we never say, we, you should never hand feed a goanna, but we do a lot of videos on there where we are doing that, and I've seen videos of people doing it with Komodo dragons um, and some establishments in America, and the trick there as well, uh, it is a good training thing as well because we, we kind of like to make them think on every angle once they get to a certain stage. Um, so say if they're coming for food in between food, slide the hand under the under the mouth once they're at a certain stage, give them a good chin chin pat and they'll get they'll get kind of used to the the stop and break and feed. Now there's um, there's a few other techniques people do use. Um, you've got the you've got the clicker technique or the um, where they where they kind of make a noise. And, and you'll see that on some YouTube's, I think Chandler's Wildlife does it with his crocodiles where he pops and um, they do certain things. And then you've got one that's very popular, which is the, the um, uh, what's it called? It's the, I've written some notes, so when I forget things. There's a coyote pizza. Well, there's one, there's a guy called- Yeah, coyote pizza, you might know him. He probably does. There's a guy called Quince Reptiles and he puts on, um, he put off a video where it was like uh, the ball point training, you know, where they come for the ball. Yeah. And um, so that's a that's a zoo, a zoo technique. For this, that's what they call kind of, blind animals, and it makes yeah. them better on like, go. And they, they do it a lot yeah. with big animals like the motor dragons, so they've got to move them about from place to place. We don't do that technique ourselves because what we do is entirely different. So what we do with our shows and what we do with our personal animals, we want to be able to touch them wherever want to just hang out with them and get them used to just kind of being around us and doing whatever they want. The, the techniques like that, the popping one, they're trying to train them to only eat for a, for a stimulation, like for a, um, for a reward kind of thing and only on cue. Uh, it's very practical and very useful in certain circumstances, but just not what we do as such. Um, we like to get them used to being touched anyway, so that you can kind of go in and do whatever you want with them. Of course, they're not going to like do tricks and do what we want them to, or or eat at a uh, at an expo show if we want them to. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that would have been awesome. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, when are we doing the whole thing? <laughs> Later on, I've still got much more to talk about, and I've got another go under to get out. But yeah. Get yeah, into the map. So. So we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the Mertens first. Um, so the Mertens is is similar to the similar to the Sandys. Um, this guy we like to we don't really do much with this one. We've got the female where she'll come sit on our shoulder, um, but the male is outside and it's a very big hassle to catch him because we put a hollow <laughs> log in the enclosure over the water and it makes life very difficult for us. Um, also, we've decided that it's quite quite exciting sometimes to see a goanna that doesn't doesn't quite like you. <laughs> it hates you. It wants you just like get away. Now you might also notice this one may get upset. He's trying to tail whip you. Tail whip. He's attacking yeah, so he's, he's you. He's moving he's about. But with this one, the most dangerous thing for me. I think the lace is going to climb on my head now. Yeah. But I think the most dangerous thing for me with this one is those back feet. So with most goannas, if they're scratching you, and you've got the, um, you've got the issue, you can see the back feet, they will just kind of tear into you and they're very strong. So 
So if you're going to hold it, you can kind of hold it like that. But again, um, one of the key points to taming any goanna and handling any goanna, and quite frankly, it's, it's very similar to the crocodile as well. Um, of course, we're going to have to have mouth tapes because we're handling the crocodile close to quarters. But uh, you don't want to do battle with them. Um, the problem is, well, the more I think it's going to the show, the more relaxed it's going to be. <laughs> Is, um, but you don't want to do battle with them. And what I mean by that is you want to hold them to a point that you need to hold them, but you don't want to hold them anymore. Um, so as soon as you try to restrict them, and, and fear can come into that a lot as well. Like They, they can be very intimidating. Um, this guy, for instance, I am very confident that a mountain water monitor is not going to bite me unless it's accidental. Um, this, this guy has bit me once when I was trying to film and he was and I was feeding and I was watching the camera and felt like he was jumping out of the water. Uh, but even the fight from this guy jumping out of the water and latching on was less damage to me than what his back claws usually had. Um, um, why his eyes more than the um, legs and the ridge tail? Well he's just a well I don't know about the ridge tail but this guy's just a smaller a smaller animal I think. Um, so people saying he needs to well, this guy does sleep under the water most of the time, especially in this colder weather. Like in the warmer weather, he will sleep on land, and colder weather down here, he will sleep under the water because we've got water heaters going. Um, he doesn't necessarily, but he can hold his breath for a very long time. And a lot of time when he is sleeping underwater, he'll just stick his nose out somewhere and right above it. Sometimes he'll just be on the bottom of the pond sleeping. Um, and that makes it very easy for us to catch him. So these guys, these guys do make great pets. It's just you've got to have a water source for them. They can be very shy, uh, which so I would recommend not putting a hollow log over a water source if you can't get them out. Um, but they are an animal that you can just get out and you can hold, and that's probably the most like the best way to start them off with getting used to, kind of force the interaction. Again, don't do battle with the goannas. So just hold them and restrict them and a, a, a good technique sometimes is to put your fingers like that and hold them from underneath. Uh, that way the head can't really turn around as much. Now sometimes I do have like lazies that will then, if they really want to bite you, they will back away from that holding and they try to get out of it backwards instead of forward or sideways because they're quite intelligent. Uh, at which point that can be quite nerve wracking and you do have to do battle with them. But ideally you don't want to do battle with them. Um, so yeah, he's, 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 he's getting much better. I'm going to be able to use him as a, as a, a shock. Or a mate, but in the bottom, will Bobby lose against him? Yeah, well, so, so this guy will get bigger. Um, the females grow much smaller, and these guys eat everything in the enclosure, so do not put anything in the enclosure that you do not want to get eaten. Um, we made the mistake when we were younger, we put, uh, we had a big three metre fish tank when this guy was growing up and we put a $40 catfish in because we had goldfish in and it wasn't eating the goldfish. Um, so we thought, he's getting well fed, we'll put catfish in, we'll put silver shark swimmers in. And he slowly picked them off expensive to the expensive. <laughs> he's a very smart boy. He is a very smart boy. He knows how to, he knows how to annoy kind of the most. So some of the, some of the ways that you can tell if a goanna is upset. Now, the best thing that you can do when you want to train a goanna is watch the goanna. Learn its mannerisms, learn what makes it tick, learn how it interacts, um, learn how it interacts with you because you, so you can see that at, on a very, very basic level, you've got a tail curling up and you've got a throat puffing out. Now you can see this guy's throat puffing out but you can't necessarily see his tail curling up. He's waving it around but it's not like a tail curl. Um, As you can I see, can see the lazy tail curl. Yeah, I've had her in the Yeah, me too. She just, she just doesn't care. It looks this, like he's... This guy will though as well, so... Yeah. It looks like when the, the tail comes like to his head, kind of, he like kind of holds his tail there. Yeah, he does. He's, he's kind of trying to... No, like, with his hands, kind of like... I saw him, like, kind of grabbing it with his hands. Yeah, Like, when his tail came to his face. He's a very, uh, very dexterous animal, this fella. 
but he's, he's doing a lot better as you can see, you can kind of just keep hold of him um, and get them used to it, but uh, where was I? Well, we might, uh, we might pop this guy back and what we might do, we might talk about the laser for a little bit. Yeah. Be no, he, he's a bit break. upset, Can but he's much better than he has been. And we have a little break before the lacing. <laughs> because we're going to be very excited. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be very excited. No, no, no. We're going to be excited for the parenting. Yeah, so we're going to I want to die from it. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> Jeez. So we will get the, um, the laser for the parenting out in a bit, but I'm going to talk about the lace here as well. So another thing, another thing I think that's more important than social socialising your animal is actually making sure that you can do that. Yeah, I think that's more important than socialising your animal. Actually, uh, proper husbandry for going and see you've got diet, uh, which is a big thing. And in my opinion, for say large, go so I'll talk on lazies because every goanna has vast different kind of offset. So diet, I prefer to feed whole prey items when I can. Um, if I can't feed, so if it's an adult and I can't feed it whole prey items, I'll get chicken necks. So it's got a bit of bone, a bit of meat. I'll put some chicken hearts chicken liver in there and if I got the money I'll get some roomy steak because they're too spoiled to go for the mint for some reason. Um, and that way they kind of get a whole whole mix of everything. Uh, a lot of, we do get messages every now and then, someone will send me a message and they'll ask if my, my goanna is twitching. Um, and in one of the one of the old books, they actually point that towards uh, metabolic bone disorder. Now it doesn't necessarily with metabolic bone disorder, um, so that's rubber jaw. So that means their bones, they don't have enough calcium in themselves and the bones kind of eat away. And like, so it's just like rubber. Yeah, so like their, their mouths would actually just um, bend over. So, so they, they do, so goannas, goannas do have double jointed jaws, but this one is like a disease, so it's like they they kind of lose the calcium in their bones and it can be very bad for them. Uh, the twitching is a neurological thing because when they lose the calcium, that also affects uh, the brain. So it's kind of, and it can be all treated and got back to the, the way it's just pumping the calcium to get the natural sunlight. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you've done something wrong as well. Most of the time it is you've done something wrong, but it can also be from the parents. Um, well, I wouldn't necessarily say the breeder as such. Like it's so sometimes if, if the lace model has say like ten eggs, um, on rare occasions, all of those eggs, but like one or two, will get most of the calcium. So in like six to a, months to a year, that baby will develop MBD without you actually having a, an issue with it. Um, so that's the nutrition side of things. UV, I find it's very important, and it's, it's, a, it's an issue you bring up on Facebook, people are gonna kind of say yay or nay on whether it's important or not, but I find it is just, if, if it cures um, with calcium, and if it, if it does a really good job in curing MBD and making them feel better, then I'd say it's, it's essential. Um, that's it, exactly. And um, so the other the other big issue with the large goanna is the heating. So you've got to have heating for all of your reptiles. With the large goanna, if you have one heat source and you've got the temperature set, so you say you've got one fasting light and you've got the temperature set at a certain wattage, a certain degree on the barking spot, that will concentrate where it is. So if you've got a large goanna and it's only concentrating heat to this much of it, that goanna is not going to notice, not going to pick up the, because it's wanting the whole body to heat up in the wild. That's what would happen, the whole body would heat up. So it will stay under that spot. And that's when the bones come. So you can see the bones on the back. So this guy was only probably this big when he got a burn on his back. Um, but it can be quite large. So the burn, the burn will go on the back. Um, and it quite, quite happens, happens quite a lot as well. Some people get them on the side. Um, we, had, we had one person message us who had, they had the two basking spots, but the, the, light, the wattage between the lights was different. So it still wasn't quite getting the same heat dispersed over the whole area. So it still got a little bit of a burn. So that's something to watch out for as well. Basically just have two, two or three watt section or a heat cord underneath. Um, depending on what monitor you've got, depends on how much heat 
bridge tail monitors, we only need one line for those, um, unless we need to get the heat up, uh, because they're just smaller. So for example, we ridge tail monitors, we want it like, if we're breeding them, we want it closer to 70 degrees Celsius. With lace monitors, I think the optimum thing put out by David Kushner was that they metabolize at like 43 degrees, so it's um, a wide range between different species. So just research and kind of uh, suss that out. So the, the taming laces, because they are cold and they will rush you, they, they, I find them sort of promise to kind of work with. Um, and a lot of it is getting them used to you. Uh, so basically for the first couple of months, I will put things into the enclosure, um, like food, water, change the light bulbs without kind of pulling them out and handling them, and just walk them past the enclosure every day. So it is in your lounge room. Um, at the moment, I've got a friend here in my bedroom. Um, so wherever you want to kind of put it so that it sees you most of the time. Um, and that, that kind of gets it used to you without a threatening, without a threatening manner. Excuse me, Rory. Yep. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. the best way to do it. <laughs> so, so yeah, the, um, and then you, then you kind of wait for, um, so once, once they're used to you walking by and they don't, uh, when you walk by, and you'll know, when, when you walk by and they stop charging at the, at the glass, that's when they're kind of getting used to you walking past. And then what you want to do is you want to, try and start feeding them. So some people we use tong feeding and throw them out. Um, I'm not an overly big fan of that method because again, I don't necessarily like to associate the food with the handling too much, but at the same time, I will put a tray of food in there, let them eat the tray, and like let them eat the food out of the tray, um, and then kind of, once they've had their bill, stick my hand in there, give them a little chin scratch. And you go slow, you go underneath, you go slow, so you got to remember as well, like, it can be nerve-wracking, and it was the most nerve-wracking thing for me after I got hit by the Ferenti, to then go back and put my hand in front of the enclosure and keep training it, because I knew what it could do, and it, it, if it's close enough to lick you, it's close enough to bite you, so it can be very nerve-wracking. Um, Just make sure you don't have anything... No, wait, so basically, it, clean my hands. dad was bitten by a blue tongue while it was ours, because... He had the blueberry smell on. Yeah. And, and that would, that loose would, tongue stinks. Love blueberries. They do. And you definitely don't want that with the lace. My dad had been by shingles back with it. That would be painful as well. While when he, um, he, would, he would grab a pair of tongs and um, they used, this was when he was a kid. He would, uh, he was a kid. Um, he would go out, lift up rocks, find them, they'd be covered in ticks. Grab the um, twigs and just get them up, put them back under the rock, and then like squish the tips on the Well, ticks are horrible, and there was actually a video on YouTube the other day. If anyone follows Camp Cannon, which probably you guys. I do. Know, I love Camp Cannon. Where he got he got bit by one of his uh, Asian water monitors because he was trying to pull a tick off it. Oh, I know that video. Now, he was pulling the tick on him. That's and it. it. That's it, and the thing he did wrong there, one, he probably hasn't thought of the, um, the chin tickle, because that would have just fixed it right up. But the main thing he did wrong was he, if, if, I think if he had put an actual chicken into the mouth of the lizard and then gone to pull it off while it's got a chicken, it's not going to bite. Because he needs something to bite or if, had, or if he had broken the, the, the train of thought between I'm feeding you and I'm going to actually handle you. Which you didn't do either. So that's that's two things you just got to make sure you do. Uh, so when you do put your hand underneath the, the chin, um, this is one I was watching on YouTube the other day, and he, he kind of pointed it out to me that um, they can't actually bite through the bottom of their chin. So you, you put your hand under there. Yes, they can bite from the side. Yes, they can bite from the front. But once you're touching underneath the chin it's very unlikely at that point for it to switch to super aggressive mode and try to attack you and it's very unlikely for it to think that it's going to bite its food and even if it does you put your hand under it and you can move it about where you want um, so that's that's another kind of aspect of the training as well uh, when you've got when you've got the um, 
when, when you're kind of teaching them and pay attention to the tongue links as well, so for a lace monitor, um, and most go in as big long tongue links, uh, just curiosity, as they start to get shorter and shorter and shorter, you can nearly, when you watch it enough, you can nearly see in their mind them thinking, I, I actually think this is poo. So th that's uh, that's when you know, right, he's thinking that's food now, I'm going to stick my hand underneath, give him a chin scratch, so that that's a concentration break. Because at that point, if you pull that, when he thinks it's food, he's going to then reinforce that and say, okay, that is food. <laughs> Here we go, bang. So the chin scratch, why is it a concentration break? So two things with the chin scratch. One, it's a, such a big muscle for the go -anus, so it just relaxes them down incredibly like so much, they, they love it. Um, if you actually see them um, in captivity as well, sometimes they will actually just like stick their neck on the ground and rub it as well, just, just massage them. Um, so by you touching them, they feel it. Uh, and that makes, and it feels good, and that makes them think, I'm associating this not with food, I'm associating this with being handled and having good feeling. So that's the concentration break there, so they, they stop. Basically it's, it's about stopping them from thinking about food. So whatever it is, we've, we've uh, like some people put a hand over the head, some people do something else, uh, like touch anywhere. We just do that um, just because they like it and we don't like to, we like to give them a concentration break or a, or a reward that is, is uh, both comfortable for them and something that they like. And uh, like the shows when they're doing a bit of parenti and we have had under his chin, he sticks his head right up, everyone knows that we've got to make they are. Um, so what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna put this guy back. Um, and we're gonna get yeah. um, what's that box behind there? That's where the clock's in, so we'll do some holes with that later on. But he's not a go on so we won't talk about him necessarily, but we'll we'll uh, get him out later on. Experience with goers, yeah. and you've got a goer that you're driving up with, you come to that stage, and you want to be able to handle the goers. Do you wear pants when you're wearing the last? So it's a, it's a tricky one. If you're if you're picking it up, or you're grabbing it, and you don't necessarily, um, and you're not comfortable with it, I do recommend wearing gloves because if you can, if you can not hesitate, you can go in and grab it. Um, that's better. Chin rubs, and things chin rubs, I would definitely recommend not wearing gloves for that, um, just because you're going to get more of your smell, and it's going to be more natural for what you're trying to get into the mind. Yeah, just you know, for the young fuckers out there. Yeah, yeah. So, so like gloves, I, I will use a glove if I've got to move and go on out. Like if I've got to move one of the young laces and I've got to pick it up, and it's tempting to try and fight me, I will I will use it as a glove initially. Gloves can also be a massive hindrance. As soon as I've got the thing out, the gloves are off. Um, because gloves give it, even though they're going to like dig into your skin and claws, gloves kind of give them an anchor point to move wherever they want, which is very, very uh, not, not exactly yeah, not exactly what you want. So we've we've had to go and say probably about like laces that are about a meter meter fifty. Um, and we've, we've bought them like that so they're not, not kind of social and I would pull it out of the glove and then if they latch onto the glove then they can move about where they want and it's, it's much easier just to pull them out, hand underneath, fingers on each side and, and do that. But as, as for sticking your hand underneath and, and chin rubbing, um, ideally without a glove but if you're more comfortable with the glove, go for the glove. So it's just, if you don't want to... You don't want to scare the animal by backing, backing out and going forward. So if you've got to wear a glove, wear a glove. Um, eventually you'll get to a point where you don't have to wear a glove and it'll get used to your own smell or it'll get to a point where it climbs up on the glove and then it will smell your skin anyway. And of course if you if you there's an old technique as well where you can put like an old shirt in the enclosure and I imagine that's do the same with the glove. If you've got your scent on the glove then that's still smelling you. Um, yeah, if it's something that you use most of the time, that's a good thing as well because if you've um, uh, repetitive, I guess. Yeah, Unless yeah. it's your favourite shirt with 
Yeah, you definitely don't want that because your one food is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like with the ones that you said eat anything. Yeah. Because then it would taste like shrimp. Well, that's it. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to say that I'm going to put this guy back and yeah, let's see what happens. Okay, so we're going to put him back. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Okay, 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 he does. So I'm going to get a friend yet, and I'm going to talk about it because it's probably better with me. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jump in, give me a hand. So the other thing, when the lizard is on your back, uh, if you're in the enclosure and you're trying to get it off, I have spent much time like just bent down trying to get it off and it just turns around. So if you it's need like, it off in no, the hurry, I feel like this, there, I'm like kind of off. Kind of it off. So there's, there's a few other videos that are out there with people. Actually, hold the lizard up higher than the body. Yeah, the kind of, and it's also it also is. So if you're so think about it this way: if you're at head level with everyone, all you see is like a mass of people and a mass of mass of everyone around. But if you're standing up here and you're looking down, you can if you look out like that, it's like there's big open space. People are down there. I can get away. I'm safe, and it's not a problem. Um, the positioning of the enclosure as well, um, having having the enclosure. So we've with our baby laces, we've got two like a stack um, for, for socialising them, and I much prefer to have the laces at the top than at the bottom because they're going to be much more uh, aggressive if all they see is these big massive people. Whereas if they're at the top, they're going to be so much so much more relaxed and, and calm. And there's there's literally like I could kind of talk for hours. About on monitor socialization, there's there's so many things and um, different different species have different ticks and, and even in the same species we've got two sibling laces that we're taming up. One of them wants to is, is, is gonna try and bite me every time. The other one is not gonna bite me at all but it will scratch the hell out of me. And they will they'll eventually both get there, but they're just um, different fears. It's just like people, like people are as different as anything else. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are um, unpredictable. Because I know that that lacy is going to try and bite me. Was that this one at the expo? It was. Oh, I'm personally scared of that. So, this, this is the one that is going to bite So, this guy is our big friendly. Um, it wasn't the one that bit me. This guy's never bit me. His brother bit me. Um, at the time we had two and we didn't quite have the room for it. We, we uh, thought they were both girls because we got the max rate. Um, and they didn't have calcification. And they were already a metre 30, so they were quite large. But saying that, they were only about a year and a half old. Um, so goannas, like these guys, these guys have a thing called indeterminate growth. Which means they grow for as long as they live. They what? Yeah, so we're going to update his enclosure and put some big rocks in there so, this so, guy can, just got, so, so he can wear them down. Yeah, because otherwise we, um, he was climbing the wire and we stopped that because he was <coughs> falling off. Now he's got nothing to wear them down and we don't really want to clip them. So well, we're out. Uh, yeah, I'm not 100% confident how far to clip that. So, yeah. yeah, um, what if So if this guy, for instance, if something bad does happen um, because he is so used to us and so comfortable with us, he is not going to turn on us in aggression. If you try to raise something with dominance and like suppress it and fight it and battle it, even though it may succumb to your will, um, if like something goes wrong, it's going to respond with aggression. Um, so it's always better to kind of just relax and treat it well. Now, now this guy is eight years old. Oh, he can. Um, he yeah. can. Uh, ten years younger than me. Yeah. 
and I think they live over 50. I'm not entirely sure how long, but we did have someone at the expo the other day that had come up to us and said he had a lace monitor for about 45 years and Rex was already 10 years old at the time. So um, it'd be interesting to see how, how old they actually live. Um, I was told uh, by a keeper at Australia Zoo when I was working there years and years ago, Komodo dragons, for instance, um, with their growth, so they have indeterminate growth as well as these guys, and they said in the first five years of life, they have optimum growth. So with these guys, it's probably not the first five years, it's probably like three. Um, so that what that means is you can pump feed them as long as it's healthy, prey items, um, etc., and keep the heat on them, and you can get them quite large. But then after that, the more you feed them, the more weight they're going to put on. This guy had a, a big guinea pig at the start of the week. Um, <laughs> How cool a rat would be? Because we've got a. Where's the other way around? Uh, you can get some rats that are bigger than guinea pigs, but. Like a giant we, we actually rat. feed this guy rabbits and guinea pigs now because it's uh, quite a big feed, and then we'll leave it for a month and he'll digest it. Um, so we had to feed him at the start of the week because we've got a school holiday for the shows. And we didn't want him pooping all over us because this guy's poop is the size of big dog poos, <laughs> but runny and it's very smelly. Um, so I'm not sure how our time's going, but uh, we could probably do some, do some, do some holes and some pets if you guys want. You guys want to come have some pets? <laughs> yeah.